I particularly would commend to you an article that you wrote about 10 years ago in the uh, Harvard Business Review. Um, uh, one of the earliest critiques and still exceedingly relevant critiques of how foundations do their work. Um, so um, if anybody wants to full detail of it, I will make sure you get it. Um, since we have a very big group, uh, we're going to run around the room as we usually do, and everyone, I would hope, will just introduce their, themselves, their name, and uh, where they hail from um, in one fashion or another. So why don't we start with you? Because I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jessica Ayler, and I'm a Victorian Wilson Research Oh, terrific. I'm James Hudson, Professor of Medicine here at Duke. <coughs> Andrea Bazan, I'm president of the Charles Engineering Foundation. Uh, Tom Lambeth, I'm a senior fellow at the Zeke Beth Reynolds Foundation. Ronnie Chatterjee, professor at Hubert. I'm Marty Martin, I'm an attorney in private practice in Raleigh, North Carolina, working with tax and organizations. And very briefly, we'll be working Thursday with the IRS on the new academic initiative program. And behind? <laughs> oh, we'll go oh, around. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, Sorry. I'm Elizabeth Wexler. I'm a first year at the Catholic School. Great. My name is Elizabeth Ireland. I'm also a first year at the Catholic School. I'm pursuing my JD at Carroll. I'm Jessica Harris. I'm also a first year at Carroll. I'm Ginger Song. I'm on the board with CARE and WWA. Wonderful. I'm Patrick Sable, and I'm a first-year public policy student here at Sanford. I'm Jennifer Preston, and I'm a first-year policy student as well here at Sanford. I'm Ariel Hayes, and I'm a first-year public policy student. I'm Abigail Sylvester, and also a first-year public policy student. Katie? Kate Carroll, third-year doctoral student. Gary Morello, the Center for Strategic Planning at Sanford School. Larry Stevens, we're in the Brett I'm Matt Nash. I manage the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship at Purdue School. Ben Knight, third year law student. Francis Redmond, mm -hmm. director of the Center for International Development. And Bill Steubing from the Green Law Foundation of the University of Minnesota. Right. Wonderful crowd. Okay, you're on. Great. Uh, thank you, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. And, um, you know, I, I do a lot of speaking, but not often to such a um, sophisticated uh, philanthropic crowd. So I really look forward to the discussion. And there's a, a lot of uh, ways that my own thinking has been stretched just in the last year or two. Um, and I want to try out some of these ideas. Uh, and I look forward to uh, having you stretch my thinking further uh, as we talk about it. So I'll take um, maybe 15 or 20 minutes and um, throw out some what I hope are provocative ideas. And, uh, and then we'll see where we go from there. Um, I, I called this talk um, something about a new vision for the nonprofit sector. I went back and forth on the title. I was going to call it What's Wrong with the Nonprofit Sector and How to Fix It, but we didn't have enough time, it assured me. So, um, but I, I really think that there are sort of uh, 
three phases that philanthropy has gone through in the United States and that we're on the cusp of this third phase. I, I think the, all of them are about how do we achieve large-scale impact with limited resources. I mean, that's sort of the fundamental challenge that I see philanthropists struggling with. Um, and the first phase was sort of the research and development phase. The idea going back to Rockefeller and Carnegie that we can come up with new ideas, we can take risks, we can pilot these uh, new projects and then prove that they've worked, that they've solved the social problem, and the cavalry will come charging in and replicate it everywhere. And it's a great vision, and it has occasionally worked, but it has not often worked. And I think that that vision, really just in the last decade or two, has been replaced by a second wave that focuses on effectiveness and scale. And has said, we need to think about what are effective nonprofit organizations. How do we tell whether they're effective or not? How do we build their capacity, bring in management expertise? And how do we help them scale? And there's been a lot of thinking about um, the difficulty with nonprofit capital markets, uh, the fact that nonprofits can get seed money to start, but then the mezzanine financing for them really to grow doesn't seem to exist. Certainly an issue with social entrepreneurship. Um, and a lot of effort has gone into that. And I think that has been a very positive step forward. But the difference in scale between the social problems we're trying to solve and even our best entrepreneurial effective nonprofits is so vast. Uh, I mean, it's really hard to imagine. I mean, you, you take something like Teach for America, uh, certainly one of the success stories of an effective nonprofit organization, an entrepreneurial organization, uh, one that has grown rapidly. They recently raised $100 million, which put them in the 400, uh, you know, the Chronicles list of the 400 nonprofits that raised the most money for the year. And they reach 40,000 kids a year. And they've been at it for 20 years to get to this point. And that's still just over 1% of the kids on free lunch in this country in public schools. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I do a lot of interviews as I work with clients in our consulting firm, FSG Social Impact Advisors. And we've been working on um, issues around water access in Africa recently. And um, I was interviewing a nonprofit that works in that field, and they were talking very excitedly about how they were bringing more money and more resources to the field, and that was really their goal. And they talked about bringing $100 million more to the issue of water access in Africa. And they talked about a, a, a somewhat distant hope that they could get the federal government to actually put in a billion dollars more. Well, it's something like a $150 billion a year problem. And I said, you know, so even if you succeed, how does that help? And the difference between doing our part, between giving money to good causes and solving social problems is such a profound difference. And I think that in the last couple years, I've really, really begun to focus on how limited the overlap is between doing philanthropy, even doing philanthropy well, and really solving social problems. We have the uh, largest nonprofit sector in the world by far. But if you look at the social issues that the nonprofit sector is really trying to solve, whether it's in education or healthcare, uh, we tend to lag most other developed countries. And of course, the role of government is much more limited. It, it has a lot to do with the role the government plays. But the amount of money given to charity annually has increased 250% in the last 20 years in real dollars, inflation adjusted dollars. And yet it's hard to see how that has improved things. So I think the good news, I'm not here just to discourage you, um, is that I actually think we are moving into yet a third wave, a third era in philanthropy. And this is one that begins to really think about systemic change 
and uh, the principles of adaptive leadership, and that's another article that uh, Ed can refer you to. And um, what's funny about it is that evaluation seems to actually be leading the way, which is not usually where I've looked to for the cutting edge in philanthropy. Uh, and I've, I've passed out a report we just released a few weeks ago uh, called Breakthroughs in Shared Measurement. And I think it's a, it's a tremendously important discovery for us that um, there actually are a number of efforts underway that are using the same system to measure performance of many nonprofits working on the same issue. And it's, it's made me realize that we bring a kind of singular focus to our philanthropy. We say it's about which organization do I give my money to? Or, you know, what's that new intervention that's going to solve the problem? Or um, which is the most effective organization working on the issue today? But in fact, if you think about after school programs in Boston, there are 50 or 60 different after-school programs in Boston. Some may be better than others, but no one of them is going to solve the problem for public education or even for after-school throughout the city. And what if, instead of thinking about which of those 50 do I give my money to, we began to think about how do I help all 50 work together better and gradually improve their performance and effectiveness over time. And that's what we've really discovered here. So we found 20 examples of shared measurement systems, and they're kind of in three different categories. The first category we found was what we called shared measurement platforms. And so there's a uh, typically technology-based platform that enables organizations to pick what they want to measure their performance on out of a range of, of indicators, and then to use these tools to pretty cost-effectively measure their performance. So one example is a group called Success Measures, which develop measures for community development institutions. And uh, they came up with about 50 or 60 different measures and created online tools, all the tools you would need to go out, surveys in Spanish and English, to go out into communities and measure, measure resident satisfaction and so on. Plus the tools so that you could upload the data, store it online, and generate reports that could help your own management or go to funders. So there are now about 200 community development finance institutions using this system. The annual cost to them for comprehensive outcome reporting is $2,500 a year. I mean, it's astonishingly efficient. Now, the system cost a little over a million dollars to develop, but the benefit of that investment is huge. Now, that system was set up so that people could pick which measures they wanted to track. And that's nice because they can customize it, but the drawback of that is that I can't actually compare two different community finance institutions because they may not be using the same measures. So the second category we found we called comparative performance systems. And the best measure there, the best example there we came across is something called the Cultural Data Project, started in Pennsylvania for arts organizations, uh, is now in um, California and Maryland, and next year is supposed to go to Illinois, Massachusetts, Ohio, and New York. So far, there are 2,400 arts organizations using this system. They fill out an annual report, 300 questions, very detailed, that then becomes the basis for grant applications, all their financial data, et cetera, and also reporting on performance. And they're all answering the same 300 questions and using the same indicators. This has meant some very powerful things. It certainly has the cost effectiveness and efficiency of the shared measurement platform. But in addition, they're able to learn from each other because they can see when one nonprofit is doing something more effectively than another. How does that guy have 60% earned revenue when I don't? Secondly, it enables uh, funders to make more intelligent 
selections because they can look at comparative performance. But it also enables them to be more realistic about their expectations. Because when this organization delivers its results, they can see it in the context of what's possible for other arts organizations. But perhaps the most important impact is it's enabled us to talk about what the field is doing as a whole in a way that we never could before. We can now talk about the state of the arts in, the, in Pennsylvania in a way we couldn't. And in fact, they used the data from the 280 organizations in the city of Philadelphia to go to the city and to demonstrate the economic impact that arts organizations had on the city of Philadelphia and were able to generate several million dollars in funding from the city based on the data they were able to show. So very powerful. And of course, the, the Center for Effective Philanthropy, which Joel and I helped to start many years ago, uh, is another example of a comparative performance system where foundations are measuring performance on the same indicators and are th therefore able to learn and improve over time because of it. But I think the most exciting uh, examples we found were in a third category. And um, we called that adaptive learning systems, perhaps not the most mellifluous. But, um, and to be honest, it's a vision I wouldn't have believed was possible if we hadn't seen it. But in Cincinnati, there are 300 education-related organizations that have been working together for two years to develop common measures of performance, but also to align their strategies and to develop common goals that they can report out to the city. It's absolutely amazing. It's all four school districts in the Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky area. It's uh, all the universities and community colleges. And it's all the major funders. And it's all the education nonprofits. And what they've done is they've organized them into what they're calling student success networks. So there are 15 of these. So all of the preschool programs heads meet together every two weeks. And all of the after-school program heads meet together every two weeks, and so on. They've, they've decided they really had to look at the continuum from preschool all the way to career counseling, if they were going to really impact the educational system. But they're divided into these student success networks. And the task is you've got to come up with a common set of goals and a common set of measures for everybody in your network and a baseline. And then once you've done that, the next step is to try and collect evidence about what is effective in your organizations and to develop an action plan to build on what works. Now, as I say, they've been at it for two years. And they've actually been able to see some positive success on citywide indicators about educational performance. It's not yet revolutionary, but there are good signs. And on the indicators they're tracking, a majority of them are showing progress. Um, and I sat in on, on a couple of these Student Success Network meetings. And it was really interesting, because they, the groups joined this initially thinking that funders were going to make them do it, thinking that if they were going to get funding, they had to do it. In fact, there was no funding tied to it. But uh, what happened is over the first year or so, a level of trust built. And, you know, the executive directors of the 20 after-school programs in Cincinnati don't have a chance to get together. They don't have a chance to learn from each other. And the conversation was at such a sophisticated level because these people were spending their lives doing this. And, of course, they cared about the effectiveness of what they were doing. And so they genuinely began to learn from each other. And it helped the whole system coordinate. Because if the after-school programs in Cincinnati wanted to communicate with the career counseling programs, there had been no vehicle for them to do it. If they wanted access to student performance data, which was pretty carefully guarded by the school district, no one of them had the clout to get the school district to sit down and come up with a process to do data. But together, they were able to begin to coordinate, to get access to data, 
and, and it's really quite remarkable. So these breakthroughs, which really started with an examination of how do you measure performance more efficiently, how do you build knowledge about what works, how do you help coordinate players in the sector, are actually, I believe, leading us to think about a new way of change, a change that is built on the coordination of the organizations, a change that is built on assembling the elements of a solution rather than trying to fund one organization that is going to achieve the solution or has the answer or the effective intervention. And it's a very different way of thinking about philanthropy. Technology turns out to be very important. All of these systems are using web-based technologies that were not around 10 years ago. Many of them were not around five years ago. And the reason they can do it so effectively and so inexpensively is because of that. But infrastructure is really important too. You know, for years, everybody in the nonprofit sector has talked about the need to collaborate. But you actually need an infrastructure if you're going to sustain collaborations. So that cultural data project with the arts organizations has a staff of 19 people. They have a help desk that you can call if you have problems filling out the form. We need that. The project in Cincinnati, Strive, has a full-time staff of eight people and a budget of about a million and a half dollars a year. But again, they need that to be able to keep the collaboration going. And lastly, I think it depends on a more realistic sense of change. That as much as we as a philanthropist would love to think that we can write a check to that perfect organization that's going to solve that social problem. It ain't how the world works. And in some ways, we have to be a lot more ambitious. We have to think about how do we get 300 organizations to work together more effectively to improve a school system. And in other ways, we have to be a lot less ambitious and say, you know, my check isn't going to solve the problem. And I have to be satisfied with the result of my funding, which is a process result which is going to take years to really achieve the outcome. And I have to have the patience for that. And I also have to trust the people in the system, the grantees, the people in the schools, the teachers, et cetera, to find the solutions for themselves. One of the really nice things about that project in Cincinnati is there is no organization telling this network of after-school organizations what they should measure. They're figuring it out for themselves. And because it's such a sophisticated, experienced group, they're coming up with very good answers that we couldn't have imposed from the outside. And so this sense of stimulating change, catalyzing change, assembling the elements of a solution, creating an infrastructure that can lead to change, I think is perhaps the next vision of philanthropy. And I look forward to having you challenge me on that. So thank you very much. Good. Well, as usual, we're going to take hands. Um, I'll start this one and see how we travel with it. Uh, Mark, what's the, uh, uh, who convenes these groups? Uh, how does this infrastructure get developed enough so that people will be willing to put their guard down and sit at the same table? Um, it's not a funder. How did it happen in Cincinnati? So. Uh, it happened in Cincinnati uh, with a community leader, the woman who was the president of the University of Cincinnati, mm -hmm. who said, uh, I need to help fix these local school systems because that's where my students come from. And they're not going to graduate college if they don't come prepared, and so on. But it was really her, it, it takes a charismatic leader is the answer. Now, in some cases, it can be a funder. Um, and we're starting to work with our clients on how to develop this. Uh, we're working on a project with uh, Eli Lilly and Company, the pharmaceutical company. And they do a lot, a lot of work with diabetes. And with many chronic diseases, and diabetes in particular, there is um, a question of maintaining the treatment, compliance with the treatment, whether all the different providers are communicating with each other, and so on. It's a 
Strive-like issue. And so Lilly has picked um, actually four neighborhoods in the U.S. and four um, regions in Africa. And they are going to try and create a, a Strive-like approach, bringing together the um, different organizations that are involved in managing diabetes care in those regions. And uh, they're going to do it as a funder. They're not going to try and impose a solution, but they're going to make it happen. Um, we've seen another example. We're working with the Packard Foundation uh, with 17 of their grantees in their sustainable fishing program area. And here's an interesting situation, too. Each of the grantees was, of course, going after the retailers, Walmart, grocery stores, to tell them, you got to sell only sustainable fish. But they were defining sustainable fish differently. The demands they were making were different. And there was no way for a retailer to sort of satisfy all of them. Uh, so Packard has actually assembled these 17 grantees. Uh, we've now been working with them for almost three years to come up with a common framework, uh, a common evaluation system, a common demand on retailers, uh, and beginning to align their strategy. And what we've seen is over the years, and it takes a year or two, trust builds among this group. It is, after all, people who care about the same issue and are trying to solve it. And uh, the dynamics around competition, around fear of what funders are going to say or who they're going to prefer, tend to diminish. Yeah. Well, I was going to start to ask you about the legal barriers and issues that you see and changes that might be, might be needed to help facilitate that. But then you sort of switched my thinking to the last comment you made about competition and um, the thought that we do have antitrust laws that are applicable. I sort of opened it up that as a thought in terms of looking at what are some of the legal areas and barriers and issues that you see that uh, either can help facilitate movement this way or, and I can certainly probably think of half a dozen more that would prohibit it under current law. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, of course, 90% of the 1.3 million nonprofits have revenues of less than half a million dollars a year, which is a big part of the problem in the sector. So I'm not sure that the antitrust department would be particularly concerned about them getting together. But, um, and, and I think in the case of, well, I'm a reformed lawyer, but I've been out of it long enough to not try and guess the answer. <laughs> um, there is an interesting example, uh, which was actually a role that a funder could play. Uh, California Healthcare Foundation uh, health Conversion Foundation is very interested in uh, improving the uh, efficiency of the healthcare system in California. And one of the problems is that each lab, when you send your lab to get things tested, uh, reports the results differently. And so it makes it very hard to have any kind of electronic health records. It makes it very hard for physicians to get the data timely and efficiently for one hospital to see what some other hospital's done. And the labs, which are for-profit organizations, were concerned about antitrust if they got together to develop a common software. So the foundation developed it and gave it to them. And they now all use it. And they felt that avoided the problem. So I, I think there certainly are cases where that arises. But I think there are ways around it. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's a real issue. And of course, you've got multinational corporations, you've got aid organizations, uh, official development aid organizations, and you have nonprofits. 
each of them is working in these regions. Each of them is not talking to the others. In fact, they're sort of speaking different languages. And uh, the lack of coordination there is, is a real problem. Um, we're actually working with a, a, a large uh, candy company uh, on the sustainability of cocoa farming in Cote d'Ivoire. Seventy percent of cocoa in the world comes from this tiny country, Cote d'Ivoire. And it's all small hold farmers, uh, very poor farmers who have a fraction of an acre of land and a few trees and no real incentives for quality, uh, eking out a living. And the question is, how do we create uh, concerted action that can uh, change how cocoa is grown and sold in this region? And so we need not just our client, but we need the other chocolate purchasers to be involved. And we need the government to be involved. And we need the farm extension workers to be involved. And the Gates Foundation is actually doing this with COCO. Uh, they have brought together a coalition of uh, corporations, nonprofits, and governments uh, working in both Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. Uh, and they are doing this with, um, excuse me, a couple other crops as well um, uh, coming out of Africa, where they're trying to build these cross-sector coalitions. I think having folks in the business community, the nonprofit sector, and government all at the table is essential. How you define the parameters of the problem is something we're really struggling with. So it's nice to say K-12 to education, Cincinnati, I know who the relevant players are. Uh, it's much harder when you start talking about health, which relates to sanitation, which relates to water access, which relates to income, which, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, where you draw the boundaries around these is something we're actually struggling to try and figure out. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, my question actually is informed by my years as a reporter at the Council of Philanthropy oh. and also a year working at the uh, Corporation for National Community Service in the Research and Evaluation Shop. Um, so I was interested in the Strive model in Cincinnati. Um, okay, so given that, especially in this economy, there's a scarcity of funding. Yes. Right. There, there is, and yeah, and I, I mean, I think there there are two big barriers to this. One of them is that concern that I don't want to be compared to other nonprofits because I might lose, and the other is funders saying, you know, this doesn't advance my immediate program objective. So why would I invest two million dollars in this cultural data project? when all I'm doing is funding eight arts organizations. I don't care about the rest. Um, both of those objections seem to go away in practice as people see the benefits of it. I think it's, it's very important that in the STRIVE model, uh, the groups are being asked to come up with the measures themselves. It's not being imposed upon them. And it's a long process. I mean, it has taken them from nine to 15 months for each of these groups to come up with measures. Uh, they've actually had uh, volunteers from GE who are trained in this Six Sigma approach work with the groups, and they've modified it for nonprofits so that there's actually a process that they work through together, which is both sort of team building, but also helps define the issues and figure out what to measure. Um, and, and I think. Um, you know, the fact that it may be, there may be a funder behind it somewhere, but the funder is not controlling what happens. It, it really is a dynamic where we're all trying to solve this problem together. Do the funders need the information, they will. But it's, um, it's not as if the grantees don't have to report anyway. And it's so painful for them right now to have to report to each funder separately on what that funder asked them for, which is almost the same, but not quite, as what this funder asked them for. The, the, the benefit of really being able to come together uh, and have a single uniform system seems to outweigh the risk. And the fact is they don't want to be laggards. They actually 
don't know a better way to do it, but if they see a better way to do it, and there's evidence for it, and there's a sense of trust, it's that learning that actually can happen. Joel. <laughs> some things that you didn't say that I think that I worry about. For example, well, I think my overall concern is that, um, that, that single-mindedly focusing on the magnitude of the problems discourages people who want to try new approaches to things. Now, I, don't, I think where you can get people to work together, it's terrific. But I think about the field of social entrepreneurship, for example, which is premised on the notion that people with good ideas can start new ways of solving problems. And I think that, that you know, if foundations or philanthropists didn't provide support for social entrepreneurs, we'd be in a hell of a shape because so much of the ideas that get generated to help solve problems come from people with good ideas who found support in order to do those things. So I worry about it from that point of view. I also think about there are exceptions that strike me when I think about Foundations. Uh, I think about some of the notable successes of the foundations really were in piloting a new program. Some, I agree with you that a lot of the pilots don't go anywhere, but there's some that did. TIAA Craft is a very good example Absolutely. of that did. I mean, it's now one of the largest pension firms in the country, and the friendship, the, the firm of choice for, for ensuring the, uh, the pensions or providing the pensions for most academics and foundation people and everything else. So when I think about, so there, there are other kinds of exceptions. That's right. You know, I think that if Mike Spiridoff, who was at the Ford Foundation and launched LISC and 25 other major initiatives, had, had, was, were so concerned about the problem of inadequate housing for poor people in rural areas and in cities that he decided to put together a, a large number of organizations working at it, I'm not sure they would have gotten anywhere. But he came up with the idea of LISC, which was he was, uh, he was smart enough, instinctive enough to, d to detect where is the niche, what's the button that I can push that will make a difference. And, it, and LISC is a good example of that. It's so a great example. I just think that you know, when, I think about the, when I think about, for example, the, the roles of foundations in human resource development in new fields, creating new fields, whether it's um, dealing with, um, um, with genetics or whatever it happens to be, it leaves what, what you've described is terrific, and I think that you're, you're absolutely correct that there does need a big cooperation, ground up cooperation among nonprofits because there's an enormous amount of redundancy, there's an enormous amount of inefficiency, and the more you can use technology and other means of bringing them together and getting them to develop ways of, of assessing, providing information about what they're doing, I think that's all terrific. I mean that. I'm not, I'm not, that's not a mock thank you. That's really true. <laughs> I believe that. But I also believe that there's a wide range of activities that aren't covered by, what you, by, by, by the, the kind of problems that you pick. And I do worry that people can get so obsessive. I mean, I think about Eli Broad, for example, who has put millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars into education, who says to me, I'm really so depressed about how little we've accomplished that I think we're going to get out of the field. I mean, that's not for publication, and I don't think he's serious about it. But nonetheless, it, it, has, that, it has that potential. And I, so I think that it's really important to have a broad panoply of the kinds of things that philanthropy, whether foundations or whether individuals coming together can do in order to get people to realize that there are things you can do as individuals or with small groups of people that you, that, that you may not solve the whole problem, but you may come at it in a way that ultimately might does solve the problem if you go about it. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, and I've, I have uh, probably uh, overstated my case uh, for the sake of trying to generate discussion and throw out some new ideas. I do think that there, is, uh, that there are you know, many different ways that philanthropy can achieve impact in the world. And I don't mean to suggest that this is the answer to all problems and there is no other. Uh, and I think that some of the institutions that foundations have created, and which you've documented in your book, um, are terrific examples of lasting change that they've stimulated. Uh, LISC is a great example. Um, they have tended not to be the pilot project and then someone will replicate it. These funders have tended to actually 
roll it out sure. themselves and make it happen. And, and I think uh, the broader theme and perhaps the theme of the Stanford article I've handed out is that funders have a responsibility to make it happen. Yeah. Uh, it, it ain't going to happen otherwise. But certainly there are different approaches that work for different problems uh, and many ways that philanthropy can achieve impact. And if I just add one footnote, I agree with everything you've now said. But there's, if I add one footnote, that there are, if, if you identify a narrow enough problem that can be solved by legislation, for example, yeah. then there's a terrific opportunity for foundations and other philanthropists to engage in advocacy to bring that about. And there are plenty of examples of how that's happened mm -hmm. and are happening today. So again, it's a, you know, it isn't a question of solving very large whole problems at once, though we need to work at them. It is a question of trying to figure out how you break off a piece of a problem that's significant and really do something about it. It is, but the, the only other thing I'd add to that is that one of the, the issues in the nonprofit sector is not just duplication and lots of small nonprofits, but the pieces of the system don't work together. I agree. We really see this in healthcare, we certainly see it in education, et cetera, and there's nobody whose job it is to align the pieces of the system. And yet it is possible and actually quite cost effective to do that. I mean, you know, again, coming back to Strive, their annual budget is about a million and a half dollars. The collective budgets of the 300 organizations involved is seven billion. So, I mean, that's good leverage there. I 100% endorse what you said. <laughs> I just think it's not the old school. I, no, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. Folks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. An easier question, please. All right. <laughs> so I can't say it all now, um, that Barry got me involved in. So, um, but you know, we have these listservs in the community foundation world, and so everybody, somebody will post a question, and then we have these great open discussions. And when I first got involved in the community foundation world, I thought it was wonderful. And then somebody challenged me when I said it was wonderful, one of my staff, and they said, you know, it creates groupthink. Uh, then we all decide this is the best practice. And then everybody goes and does what everybody thinks is the best way of doing it. And, and so I do think it stalls innovation. I do think that then we stop thinking outside of our box when we do that. And, and we have done that with our nonprofits here in the Triangle, which is what, where we serve. And we get them together, like say all the youth serving organizations, and, we, and they'll say, you know, this is the first time we are working together. And, um, and they very quickly, I think, um, need more time to convene, um, need more funding, and we'll provide that. And then I think when you talked about aligning strategies, um, eventually I think they do lose some, some of those opportunities to, to have their own work um, be uh, creative and original. So I do have that concern. But I think I was mo mostly struck by what you said as far as are we simply giving money to an issue or uh, solving a social problem? And um, you know, I, I don't know at the end of the day um, in my role at the foundation, if we are solving any problems, if you think about it. I think we're giving money to an issue. Um, and I think that the only way we truly solve a problem is if we have an advocacy role. And that is a question that is still not being answered fully by all people in philanthropy. I think that in the community foundation world, we do take an advocacy role. We have an opportunity to lobby. But I think that when you bring up that question among people in philanthropy, you have very strong opinions about whether or not you should participate in advocacy. And so I think you have posed a very important question here. I don't have an answer. I have my own opinions on it as a former lobbyist. But, um, but I think that the questions that you have posed in this article are extremely important. Um, and so perhaps that is maybe your third, you said you called it your third, mm. what did you call it, your third? Wave era, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't written that one yet. Uh, but I think it's a challenge to philanthropy to truly look at its um, investment of resources. Um, it is. And, you know, I, I really have, um, I, I, again and again, I, I do come back to this issue about the difference between giving away money and solving a problem. And uh, when we did interviews, and I cited it in the article, uh, the Gates Foundation asked us to interview highly effective philanthropists. 
And uh, we interviewed a couple dozen people, all different backgrounds, working in all different areas. Um, and we didn't really expect to find anything in common. But what we found was they all sort of came into philanthropy uh, because of, you know, some visible wealth that they were then approached by people in the community. They responded to requests. Every single one of them at some point got discouraged. I mean, just as Joel described uh, Eli Broad uh, and said, you know, this is, I'm giving away lots of money. I don't see anything different. And then at some point, an issue arose that was of real personal significance to them. I mean, it was a, a beautiful theater in downtown Seattle that was going to be torn down by a developer. Uh, it was a, 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 a woods that uh, the guy had hiked on as a child that was, again, going to be developed. It was someone whose son had a, a rare brain disease. And they stopped thinking about giving away money. And they started thinking about solving a problem. And it, completely changed how they went about what they did. And they didn't just use money, and they didn't just work with nonprofits, but they used their network, they used their connections, they certainly lobbied. Uh, they used every tool at their disposal to make change. And, and I think that um, I certainly started out 15 years ago thinking about promoting philanthropy and thinking about helping the nonprofit sector. I think um, I, I'm not so interested in that anymore. Uh, I, I'd like to solve social problems. I think it's urgent. I think we need to make much more progress in the next 20 years than we have in the last 20 years. And I don't think philanthropy is, I think philanthropy is a tool and can be effective. It's certainly not the only tool. And I think philanthropy for its own sake, it, it has value. But it's not what motivates me anymore. So, uh, do you think the private, there's some models in the private sector that might be helpful in terms of thinking about this issue? What I'm thinking about is really a multiplicity of approaches to a problem. So, you know, Microsoft is a little company, a little bit big company, and so is Google, and so are lots of other. Um, and in fact, um, I, I'm wondering what the barriers to the kind of scaling that takes place in the private sector. Sure it has. Because there's not a school system in the country probably that hasn't had been impacted by TFA in some way or another. But nevertheless, it, there, in the private sector, there appear to be a multiplicity of approaches to solving problems. And the, there's venture capital with little companies, and some little companies with some big companies. And there, uh, there's a lot of best practices and benchmarking and that kind of thing. But systemically, what's the difference? Well, cer certainly the benchmarking and the performance measurement uh, and the fact that people know the results um, I think is tremendously important and is a big difference. And it, you know, obviously it weeds out unsuccessful companies and rewards successful ones. And we don't have that clarity in the nonprofit sector. Um, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's risky to go too far in the analogy with the for-profit sector. Uh, the access to capital as you grow becomes much, much easier in the for-profit world. You, know, you start off, it's very hard to raise that first round of venture capital, then you have some, it's easier, and then you go public, and there's lots of money you have access to, and then you're issuing bonds, and it's a very low interest cost, and so on. It, it doesn't get easier in the nonprofit sector. If you want, need to raise $100 million this year, it's not easier than when you had to raise $10 million a long time ago. Uh, so I, I think that... Um, the opportunities for scale aren't there. The difference, I, I think, or at least they operate differently. They operate differently. Let me just stop you. Just, so there would be people who would say Gary Kirchler, who owns Stone Shield Group, right. and who is an incredible uh, social entrepreneur. And he just, it says, you know, because of what you just said, he thinks the biggest opportunities for social change are in the for profit model, not the non profit right. Really want to go after the world's biggest problem, you need 
Yeah, no, I, I absolutely think that's right. Um, I, I, again, there are limits to the for-profit model. There are always going to be populations you want to serve that have no income that they can spend. Um, there are things you're going to want to do that aren't necessarily popular, and therefore they won't sell. Uh, but where possible, uh, I think that for-profit models can have uh, can scale much more rapidly, and can have huge impact. Um, and and I think that is part of the beauty of the social entrepreneurship movement. It has sort of opened up donors and philanthropists to think about for-profit in addition to non-profit models. Uh, part of our consulting practice is with companies uh, on their corporate social responsibility. Um, and when we're working with a global company, they can do things on a scale that the nonprofits can't. And um, just, I mean, we're working, I was telling Ed earlier, with a medical devices company. And they came to us to have a strategy for their foundation, which gives away maybe $10 million a year. And we persuaded them that actually, if they were to manufacture inexpensive medical devices, that were tailored to meet the needs of developing countries and use their R&D capacity, their manufacturing capacity to do that, they would have far greater impact than what we could get the foundation to do. And they're actually setting up a new division at the company, an operating division. Yeah. Friends for that is, is a vehicle for accomplishing goals. But I, you know, one question I have in response to your comments, I was just sitting thinking, how many people are even asking the question about the effectiveness of their philanthropy? I right. Think it would make a depressing kind of an observation, but but it just seems like so many people, it's a hard thing. You know, they want they target it. You know, it's, it's that one thing, and they say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, but I know I'm building that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's not a huge percentage. It's uh, certainly a lot more than it was 20 years ago. So that, I think, is a very positive thing. And in my experience, it's independent of the size of the giving. I, in my experience, it's sort of around 10 or 15% of donors, and it doesn't matter the size. Uh, but the other thing I'll say is that you know those donors we interviewed for Gates who were solving social problems found it so rewarding that they began to apply that in all aspects of their philanthropy. And I think that once people have an experience of not just writing a check and getting a thank you, but actually feeling that they are making a significant difference on a social issue, that is so meaningful in their lives that they don't turn back. So there's hope. Yes, ma'am. Sonny? Um, so it's just about the private sector. And I'd like to bring the government back. Mm.
Right. Well, I mean, I sure, although I'd, I'd worry more about our government. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, whether our government can really function uh, to address social needs, whether uh, lobbying has so significantly distorted the legislative process that it is not necessarily responding to the needs. Um, you know, I, I think that it would be nice and indeed you know we we work in Europe and uh, one of the reasons social conditions are generally much better in Europe is the government has played a, a much stronger role and has been much more responsive to meeting social needs um, so I think that uh, I'd rather have Gates around trying to do what they do uh, given that the government doesn't seem to uh, be solving it uh, my first choice would be a government that does it right, but given where we are, I, I think that the net benefit of having these philanthropists around uh, is a positive. And as, you know, going back to some of Joel's comments, they're philanthropists of all different stripes and shades and points on the spectrum. And actually, one of the studies I've always wanted to do is how much money going to the nonprofit sector is going in just to oppose other money going into the nonprofit sector on the other side of the issue. Uh, Yeah, I think, you know, no, that, oh, it, it's clear that didn't work, yeah. Um, uh, they see that. <laughs> huh? Yeah, they, well, they, right. Uh, I, I, you know, Gates was spending $500 million a year on public education, a vast sum. I believe it was a tenth of 1% of what's spent on public education. I mean, even the largest philanthropists are such small players. It's not to say they can't achieve tremendous leverage. They can. But uh, it's not, they're not going to overwhelm government spending, I don't believe.